Hello and welcome to another podcast episode of the project BioFruitNet. My name is Sophie Tanner and I'm meeting online with three experts on biodiversity in organic fruit farming. I'm Lena Sigsgaard. Uh, I'm a professor at the Norwegian University of Life Sciences. Uh, I'm also affiliated to University of Copenhagen and I worked for many years with uh, how you can control pests in orchards and other crops. Hello everyone, I'm Francois Warlop. I'm working in France in a research group for organic farming and I'm more specialized with uh, fruit crops and also biodiversity aspects to control uh, mostly pests in fruit crops. I'm Jutta Kinsle. I'm uh, more than 35 years active in organic fruit growing. I'm partly a free researcher and partly I'm working for the University of Onheim in projects for pest control and the enhancement of biodiversity in organic fruit growing. So we are really interested in how we can prevent pest problems in orchards and uh, here biodiversity and especially functional biodiversity is really important. And uh, uh, as you know, orchards are perennial crops. They have insects and mites feeding on them. Uh, we call them insect pests. And this feeding from the pests can reduce the growth of the trees, it can damage the fruit, and it can reduce the yield. And some pests, they can complete their whole life cycle in the apple. Some will overwinter in the soil under the trees, and some will be able also to feed on other plants. But this life cycle of the pests, they follow the plant. So for example, the winter moth, uh, they do require very new tender leaves to feed on and if they hatch later then uh, the larva cannot feed and that's an example of a pest which some years become really really destructive and can cause big losses in the orchard. Another example is the rosy apple aphid. Uh, when these aphids feed they stress the plant and they give in the end misshapen fruit and uh, crop losses. And um, if the pests go above uh, acceptable densities, then the grower needs a way to control them. But then luckily these attacks from winter moth and aphids and other orchard pests do not always lead to outbreaks because they are controlled by various factors like the weather, and the host plant condition, and very importantly, their natural enemies. And then for us to maintain a good population of natural enemies in orchards, we need to provide them with food throughout the season so that they can survive and be there around to control the pests. Also, uh, fruit trees, they need pollination to give fruit. And we need enough pollinators to visit the flowers during that short period when the trees are flowering. Uh, but what should the pollinators feed on the rest of the year? So these populations of pests in orchard, they will vary throughout the year. And uh, there's not enough resources for the beneficial insects in the trees the year round. But the orchard pests, um, they can be there. So the trees, they only flower these two, three weeks. And the insect prey feeding on the apple trees, they peak certain periods and in other periods, they are low. And that means that if there's nothing else for the natural enemies to feed on, then their numbers will then decrease and drop and there will not be enough natural enemies when the next pest outbreak is there. So we need to provide the natural enemies and the pollinators with some additional resources of prey and of pollen and of nectar. And that's why we need some biodiversity. We need some nature in and around the orchards to provide living places, the habitats for the natural enemies, for the pollinators, such as flower strips or hedgerows or meadows, or pile of stones or small lake or 
a little forest or whatever. For example, bumblebees and white bees, they need undisturbed soil to nest in or nesting in cavities of trees. And some predators like the earwigs also need to nest in the soil and then the soil should not be disturbed. And nature also provides overwintering sites, uh, like inside grass tussocks um, for the carabids or cracks in the bark for bark box and ladybirds. And beneficial insects can also find prey to eat in nature, uh, different prey, different plants, and they need pollen and nectar from different flowers also. So a diversity of habitats and overwintering sites will cater for a diversity of natural enemies and pollinators. A diversity of plants will have different prey that they can feed on, and a diversity of flowers will be able to support more different pollinators and even extend the period of flowering if you have flowering plants that flower early, mid-season, late season and then better support pollinators. Just consider, for example, the bumblebees. Some are active already in March, even in Denmark and <laughs> Norway, and even until October. And for all this time, they need food. And then you just have a few weeks of flowering in the trees on their own. Um, native natural enemies which we want to support will also be evolutionarily adapted to the native plants, so it's better to use native plants. And while pollen and nectar are essential to pollinators, it's also important food for natural enemies. Pollen and nectar is also food for parasitoids uh, and adults of important natural enemies of pests such as surfeits and lacewings. But even predatory mites and ladybirds and predatory bugs will feed on pollen and nectar, and this will help them to survive periods when there is less prey. So with less nature in intensively cultivated areas and with the pollinator crisis acknowledged now in the EU, where we see that pollination is not always enough, then growers cannot rely necessarily on the surroundings providing these important ecosystem services of pollination and biological pest control. Also, um, research shows that the benefit of, for example, a flower strip will be stronger near the flower strip than further away. It's not so surprising considering that uh, some insects can move further and some not so far. Um, and this, of course, makes something like inter-row flower strips an attractive way to support beneficials. So we say, as a rule of thumb, the uncropped area, I mean, all these types of nature or semi-natural habitats, such as small meadows and hedgerows and patches of trees and so on, should cover at least 5 to 10 percent of a farm to sustain the necessary ecosystem services. And these semi-natural habitats need to be undisturbed, as so many beneficials will be nesting or all wintering there. And then time is really of the essence. For example, there was this five-year study in a Canadian IPM orchard with large plots with, with or without flower strips, where you could see pesticide need in those areas with flower strips dropping gradually over the years because they needed it less and less as the populations of the beneficial insects increased. So in short, to support natural enemies and pollinators, we need plant and habitat diversity. And now I'm talking about many different species and, and uh, many different species, not just one, 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 but a more even distribution of many species. Uh, and they need enough area, uh, better be perennial and better when they they work better when they're close to the orchard naturally. Biodiversity cannot on its own always keep pests in check, but it's really a valuable preventative tool that will reduce the need for other control measures. And then there's much work these years directed 
towards identifying which plant species to choose to best support natural enemies and pollinators and the general biodiversity as well. And to make this tailor-made flower-rich habitats, we're looking at making them adapted to the soil and to the climate and to the crops of a certain area. And some important criteria is a long flowering season, that the plants are native, that they are many perennial ones, and then select the ones that the beneficiaries can use. Of course, the value of different flowers can differ a lot, uh, and the value of a plant species will be different for different species of insects. For example, open flowers with a short corolla, uh, such as Asteraceae, they are needed for predators, parasitoids, and, and solitary bees to even get their head inside, down, and get the nectar. While bumblebees and honeybees, they have long tongues and can also use flowers like clovers and other fabaceae. So then also, of course, a final concern is uh, how can we avoid to bring some plants that might give more diseases and pests? So uh, we should avoid those that host major diseases and pests. During your talk, Line, um, I saw you thought that you shook your head when Line was referring to the surface area on a farm that should be left natural. So maybe you want to jump in and say some words about that. Yes, um, the thing is that uh, many uh, organic farmers have uh, um, um, orchards that are rather small, and if they have to um, leave five to ten percent of the area to natural um to to not production area this will create a problem and so we in in germany we focus very much on the fact that we can integrate biodiversity measures in the production area and not have only to say here we produce and there we make nature uh, biodiversity measures but we integrate biodiversity measures in the production area we have done a six years project and we could show that we really could with um, measures in the orchard without losing production area we could enhance biodiversity and functional biodiversity but also general biodiversity biodiversity, looking for butterfly or grasshoppers or whatever, we could really uh, enhance two to four, four times uh, to, uh, let's say, an orchard without these measures. And so I say, I think we shouldn't take this as a, um, as a standard to say we have to leave uh, five to ten percent of the production area to, to biodiversity measures outside of the orchard. We can do also something inside if we can combine inside and outside it's even better but if due to the structure of the farm we can't we should not say this is bad but the, the farmer can do a lot of things in the biodiversity in the in the production area and this is a chance to combine functional biodiversity and uh, agro the, the enhancement of agrobiodiversity without losing production area. And we have to think that 70% of the insect species that are in uh, problems, that are vanishing, are not insect species that are living in um, natural spaces, but that these are insect species that are collegated to the cultivated areas. So what we have to do also is to enhance the biodiversity on the cultivated area, not only to look at the surrounding. So, so Jutta, uh, I, I acknowledge that the conditions for, for growers is very different among our countries. And uh, I also acknowledge that when you have a very small uh, farm, it's hard to put aside so much area. And uh, we really need to look also into what we can do inside the production area, like, like crop diversification. And as I mentioned before, the use of interval flower strips, which we have actually uh, shown in a previous project that even in an existing orchard, you can put in uh, these interrow flower strips 80 to 100 centimeters wide with the right equipment. So, so there are some possibilities to explore and 
and to work with there also for sure. Um, and I think also why I set these five to 10% is that when you come to some places, when the farm is bigger, it's really needed. And what I maybe failed to, I, and what I think we should also talk about at some point is this kind of the design or the redesign of the orchard and where to put which structures to get that number of, uh, of pollinators and natural enemies which we really want to control our pests and to get a good yield. Yes, uh, several things that I wanted to, to point out, um, starting with the fact that um, uh, biodiversity will be efficient if we have uh, adapted uh, practices and I think uh, it should be important to have uh, also adapted cultivars because uh, it's the first choice that can have a real impact on uh, efficient functional biodiversity. If we have uh, only susceptible cultivars, then you have no chance to have a, a good regulation of aphids, for example, or other scale insects. And so cultivar choice is uh, very a key element and also fertilization practices have to be uh, adapted and, and, uh, and uh, balanced in order to avoid a, a strong uh, pest uh, infestation. So biodiversity has to be linked to other uh, practices and the, the, the organic orchard has to be seen as a system uh, with a systemic approach as a global system because the soil is related to the to the vigor of the tree and the vigor of the tree will be related to the pest infestation so i think the farmers has to have all these elements in, in in mind to 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 set up biodiversity because it will be just useless if uh, if the tree is much more uh, too much fertilized and and if the cultivar is not adapted to his soil then it it will be uh, just a uh, vein and other elements I wanted to add is uh, sometimes the most easy is to just let the spontaneous flora develop into the orchard because it depends what kind of uh, uh, soil and, and flora you have but uh, um, it may be more incentive for farmers to just uh, reduce mowing reduce fertilization and then the, the flowers will be more diversified, diversify, much more adapted and sometimes more efficient. So then you are, of course you have uh, biodiversity inside the orchard with many spontaneous flora. Uh, just one, one remark is in France we have a rather new law which is called which is called the B B directive that means that as soon as you need to spray fungicide or insecticide in the orchard you need to cut down all the all the flowers of the orchard to avoid uh, pollinator side effects of your treatment so this is a really um um counterproductive uh, directive that we are thinking about and we are Still wondering uh, why it, why it has to be so 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 strict, but uh, this is so, something to consider when you have a lot of flowers. Then you also need to take care about what you will use for spray in your orchard because you can also have a, a huge side effects on beneficials and pollinators. Well, uh, I can say that we have data of 21 sites uh, of five years in Germany of uh, farmers that did their normal spraying program, that we could really enhance the number of uh, uh, biodiversity, insect biodiversity in the orchard, that we, that we could enhance the number of wild bees and so on. And we couldn't see any um, adverse effect of the spraying so you have to to to, to think about if you have um, products that are toxic to bees it's clear that you cannot leave the flowers but if you have sulfur and baking powder and uh, codling moss granulovirus i don't see any problem 
and I think we have to be careful to discuss this with the authority in this case of France, because otherwise, if you keep the production area clean, you will never uh, manage to enhance agrobiodiversity as we have to do this, because the main problem is not only the pesticides, the main problem is, the, is that we don't have structures where these uh, insects can survive. So if you keep the, the, bio, the agro the, the production area clean, you will not have a functional biodiversity, you will need more pesticides, and you will never manage to, to bring agrobiodiversity really in the, in the wide area. And for this, this is very, very contraproductive. I want to, can I contribute? Because I think what Jutta is saying now is really, really important. It's the word clean. And it's the, the point about changing your view about how an orchard should look like. And the traditional view of having it clean, you know, shortcut grass, nothing else, and then the trees, that's what we're talking about. And there was actually a few years back a, a big study across EU published, which showed that uh, okay, organic farms, they have lower yields than the conventional ones. But if you look at the biodiversity aspect, you will see that those farms that have a good level of biodiversity, they are able to narrow that gap. So they, with this preventative measure, they reduce the number of times they need to spray. They reduce the number of times they have to look for alternative treatments. They save money and they get closer to what you can get in a conventional farm in a much more sustainable way. And I think that's super important. So what can farmers actively do to reduce the cleanliness of their production area? Uh, well, the first and the easiest thing is to do alternative mulching. This is something everyone can do, and uh, this means that you, uh, if you go mulching, you mulch only each second row, and then uh, you go, you um, you you come back, and then you uh, mow the alternative row, and you let let the grass uh, and the flowers grow a little bit, so that uh, you have some flowers in the orchard. That's the very easiest way. The, the second thing would be uh, to use the mowing machine of the, um, for, the, for the flower strips and to let the vegetation in the middle of the rows uh, come, become a little bit higher. And so you would have more natural flower. And the third thing, if you have no, not a good natural vegetation, what happens in our region, then it would be to sow really a flower strip with very ma many different flowers uh, species, as Lene explained uh, already, with, with open flowers and closed flowers and different flower times and so on. And it is very important to, to use regional seed um, and the, this um, gives a very good um, also enhancement of beneficial insects. And you, if you have to mow this what, what, two or three times a year, otherwise you get problems with voles. And you have also to adapt your vole management. Um, then you can, at the border of the orchard, you can establish another kind of flower strip that you can leave uh, the whole year without mowing. You can build hedges, you can plant anchor plants, you can uh, put uh, stone piles and wood piles. Um, Whatever can you do? We have a catalog with 44 measures that you can establish in your orchard. You can put uh, nest boxes for uh, for birds and for bees, and and um, you can just be let your, all, your orchard a little bit disordinated. So um, I think, Lina, it was you in, in your summary that you said you should avoid plants or flowers that attract diseases or give um, habitat to pests. Do you have examples for those um, plants that should be avoided? Uh, I have been thinking about one, and, and uh, that's for the rosy apple aphid. It will be in uh, the Plantago uh, during the summer. So uh, 
there are some flower strip mixes which include Pantago and, and we took it out. But the interesting thing is I've been searching the literature for proof if Plantago in the orchard would give you more aphid problems. And the papers I found say they cannot find any connection. But I mean, just out of precaution, I think you should do that. And, and it, it's, actually, it's a, actually a little bit the same with diseases because I've talked to some plant pathologists and, and also they have these, I forgot, exactly the species, they have these species they want not there to take precaution. But sometimes when they look into the data, it's really hard to find the connection. So I think we should omit certain species out of precaution, but what we really see is if we create a good, healthy biodiversity with some knowledge of the needs of our beneficial insects, then that's the main thing. Yeah, we ha may have another well-known example with the uh, Crataegus species that are also very useful in uh, hedges and functional hedges. Uh, but we have some uh, doubts about if it could uh, host uh, fire blight. It would be an uh, important disease for pears and apples. So most of the advisors, they did not recommend to plant uh, Crataegus in the hedges. Although, as uh, Lina said, we, we don't really know how far it will increase the fire blight uh, in the orchard, but as a precaution principle, we will uh, just um, withdraw from, from the list. Yes, I think we have to exclude from the hedges all the plants that can be affected with fire blight. And we also say the question of sooty blotch which is a big topic in Germany. Uh, so for instance, um, salix species, we, um, we advise not to plant uh, in the, the direction where the wind is blowing, because otherwise you get salix species and also other alnus and, and such plants that can host um, sooty blotch on their um, bark. Then we say we, sh we shouldn't plant this. We say also if you have um, the um, Drosophila suzukii and you have stone fruit, you shouldn't plant host plants that um, where the fruits are susceptible to su su uh, Drosophila suzukii. If you talk about the herbaceous plants, um, we look uh, that the plant shouldn't make problem on the tree row. Uh, for instance, the cistles and such things, and also we in, in excluded also Heracleum, because Heracleum can form some some uh, uh, I, islands near the, the the trees, and then it's difficult to make the the um, tillage, and and so we, we so we inc inc excluded some plants that could um, uh, create problems for tillage. And we excluded also Rumex, for instance, that can, of course, is, is not a plant that you want in your art orchard very much, and that's spontaneous very, very often. So we produced also our own uh, herbaceous mixtures, because in the herbaceous mixtures for the border that you can buy, you often find plants that may create problems in the orchard. Just thinking about the uh, Prunus petus, the bird cherry, and, and we talked a lot about plants as a source of food and habitat for beneficial insects. But some plants can also work as trap plants for pests. And there is a study in Belgium that indicates that this Prunus padus could be a trap crop for Prosophila suzuki, so that they can put their eggs in it, but the larvae cannot complete their life. And if this is true, that is super exciting. And, and this is not my main research area, but there are people who work also with, with plants as trap plants. So you can use plants in many ways uh, if you have the biological knowledge. Well, design is a, a key thing, of course. Um, uh, it depends, of course, where we are talking about uh, if we are in a pretty intensive uh, production areas then it the, the 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 margin we get to 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 change the orchard design is pretty limited 
but for organic farmers, they may have a, a lot of choices to adapt their design. And um, I already spoke about the, the choice of the cultivars to have adapted the cultivars for organic and to reduce um, reliance to pesticides. Uh, we have a few research examples that show that in some orchards, when you mix cultivars within within the orchards, you, you may reduce apple scab uh, intensity. So it should be uh, it should it should be known that uh, the more you will uh, um, reduce homogeneity in your orchard, the more you will uh, have a, a resilience of your of your system. And of course, you, you can mix apple cultivars together, considering that it will uh, get more uh, difficult to, to, to work in the orchard, to spray, to harvest, or to prune your, uh, your orchard. Um, this is probably why few farmers go into these uh, diversification schemes. But you may also mix fruit species in your orchards when, if you want to have uh, other fruit uh, species than only apple. Uh, if you have uh, direct selling that you will be interested to have uh, stone fruit and pippin fruits uh, in, in your farm to, to have uh, uh, happy consumers. So you may be interested to have more diversified uh, orchards with um, four or five fruit species. And of course, uh, this, this is not yet agroforestry, but if you want to go further, you, you may consider to integrate many different options, like uh, animals can be a first option for fruit growers to in, in include uh, um, animals like poultry or uh, sheep in your, in your orchard. This is something we, we, we start to see and we, we see many uh, beneficial side effects of uh, integrated animals in the orchard. And of course, you can also include other uh, production uh, species uh, like uh, economical uh, valuable, like uh, aromatic plants or vegetables or uh, other, uh, kind of, uh, other kind of plants. Then there are many different options. I, um, I don't know how far we can go talking about the design, but uh, I know quite a number of uh, farmers in France doing this kind of agroforestry with fruit, uh, fruit-based agroforestry. And all the, all the orchards, all the agroforestry systems are pretty different because the farmers are, have different surfaces. They have different priorities, they have different constraints, talking about the light, about the, uh, the soil uh, conditions. So the design is to be adapted to each uh, growing conditions. Um, diversification generally will uh, we in, in increase the, the ecosystemic services in, in, the, in the system. That means if you have a uh, different fruit species, then you, you may have a dilution of, of your pest. You will have a more beneficial, like more birds and, and arthropods in, in your orchard. Um, you, you need to just not to go too far in order to have a too much diversified orchard, then it will get more difficult to, to, to manage. Uh, so it's uh, always a matter of uh, balance and, and compromises. Um, but uh, yes, diversification and agroforestry will uh, help for biodiversity. If you have vegetables, then you will get more uh, more flowers in in your uh, in your system. Will get more um, more uh, fauna also in your system, and so the the vegetable can bring ecosystemic service to the trees and the trees will bring ecosystemic service to the to the vegetables like uh, uh, wind break uh, wind breaking uh, um, organic matter that is also brought to the vegetables of course uh, sunlight that will be reduced uh, thanks to the trees on on vegetables but also on animals so yeah the the range of 
ecosystemic service will be much broader if you if you include the uh, fruit trees in a cultivated uh, system. I would like to add something because uh, we are discussing now a lot of things that are in the way of research and that are very fit and interested farmers will are doing this. We have a, a big group of farmers that are really, uh, let's say, trying to, to test this and that, and they have the orchard of the future with mixture of varieties and so on. But we have also a big group of, uh, but we have to add that this is also more demanding. The management of such orchard is much more difficult than just to pass and to follow a spraying plan, let's say. And uh, we have a lot of farmers that feel overcharged of the, by, by all these things. And we have also to, to consider them. And we have to consider that what we propose shouldn't be, uh, let's say, fit only for a small group of very fit persons. And this is the problem that we currently face. We have still to do a lot of research and a lot of practical research to make these things easier to manage. We have the, the, the question of the wheat strips and there the, the management of the bowls is more demanding. You can do it if you are fit and clever, you can even use the strip uh, as a part of the bowl management. There are farmers to do this and there are farmers that say, I'm afraid, I'm, I can't manage and I have a very, let's say, inexperienced person doing my bowl management and I can't do this. And the more we go in this diversification, the more we leave a group of farmers behind. And if you discuss, discuss with the IPM people, I am completely out of this. Uh, so what we have to do is to find schemes uh, that are, let's say, easy to manage. And we have also to do a lot of schooling. And we have to, to consider that, that this is more demanding and this should be also the cost of the apple or the, the fruit will be higher because the, the qualification of the persons that are doing this uh, must be higher and so on and so on. So we shouldn't tell here the story that this is just everything wonderful. We have just to do this and then the world will be wonderful. This is not true. But it is more demanding, and we have to find solutions for this. Yeah, I totally agree, Jutta, with uh, with your concern and and, and your um, um, what you said. Of course, research still has progress to do on 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 this on this diversification, which is a, a huge topic. But I think also the farmers are doing research themselves, and 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 sometimes bring more interesting results to the to the research and i have the the example that talking about voles uh, some fruit farmers show that uh, the sheep in the orchard uh, um, reduce all the voles and and all the voles disappeared from the orchard because of their practice so started to to have more work with the sheep uh, in the orchard but at the end they didn't have anything to do for the voles so, I mean, we, we need to consider that in, indeed it diversification is more costly, but it can also bring us several services that were not uh, anticipated. So I think it's also important to have more and more example in the fields, even if it's uh, sometimes uh, uh, costly for the farmers, but because we get much more feedbacks and, and, and results from the fields that research could not do by, by itself. We have, we have a, a situation where, where we are kind of, we have to move towards more biodiversity. We have to move towards using preventative measures like providing habitat, living conditions for beneficial insects, we need to look at how to solve the pollinator crisis. Then at the moment, it's like everything is put on the shoulders of the producers. That's how they feel it. And that's not quite fair. Uh, it's not, we need to educate also consumers that they cannot expect every fruit to be 100% perfect because then they'll get it with pesticide residues and they don't want this. 
So, and and then we need to look into how do we prioritize uh, our research because as as you really said, farmers they need the support, and and as a society, we need to move this way, and we cannot uh, rely on companies that are producing pesticides to provide it because they, their interests are different. So it is a challenge and there needs to be some kind of um, process in the society as a whole towards this. And I think there is, I think I mean, even consumers are really interested to get fruit without residues and even more. They're interested in, in seeing uh, wildlife and seeing nature around them. I hope. Um, I think the first thing is, uh, if I say we need more research, I'm not talking about university research, but I'm talking about the, the kind of research we are doing here. The growers together with the university and the, the growers are, let's say, the initiative part. Um, I would very much agree to what Lene said. Uh, together with our biodiversity projects, we started uh, also to bring out um, a guideline for quality of organic fruit. So if you look uh, for fruit that had that has a perfect shape, uh, the organic farmers can produce this, but the question is what is the price of this? Uh, organic product is a product that uh, has to do with um, that the people trust in what we do. If we have all apples that are clean as the conventional apples, question is how long people will believe that we do a lot of biodiversity and so on and so on uh, if they see these apples. So part of this uh, biodiversity issues must be also that the apples are also allowed to have a certain biodiversity. And this is something that we have to, to transport into society. Otherwise, uh, it's, it's for the farmers, it's not convenient to do these biodiversity things because if you have more insects, you will have more. Uh, we, couldn't, we couldn't show uh, some real significant difference in insect damage, uh, but of course people are afraid uh, and will keep their orchards clean if they know that they cannot uh, sell any apples with the trace of an insect. Well, I'll just give a little uh, talk about why we also need science. You could almost expect that. <laughs> uh, as, I was, uh, as I was saying before, uh, there's a lot of work going on now on how to kind of make tailor-made flower strips, what elements do we actually need in an orchard to get the right beneficial organisms and so on. And to do that, we need to know well the biology of those natural enemies and what they need for their whole life cycle. And we need to know how they match with those plants that we want to put. So. The current research, when you look at, for instance, studies of flower strips, it's not like one way. Most of it shows good effect. Something does not. And I believe it's because we have not looked closely enough into what mix did they then study. Uh, sometimes it was not even a mix. It was just one species of flower. Uh, so we need to know more to make these tailor-made uh, or bespoke uh, mixes and, and uh, we need to know more about where we put them. And we have a realization that we need many different types of these, what we sometimes call semi-natural habitats, like the hedgerows, like the little pond, like the pile of stones and so on. But to really take care of, of those natural enemies and those pollinators that we need, we need to know their biology. And that is also something the farmers need. They need it at a more practical level. So we need this dialogue going between the universities and the advisors and the growers back and forth so that we don't get lost. Uh, as a scientist, we don't get lost, we don't fall into a hole. <laughs> 
of 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 some little not very important point but I think you can say that you cannot have one without the other if you want to have a good solution. Yeah, in a, re a previous research project called um, uh, Echo Orchard with uh, Lynn, we, we wrote um, uh, guidelines also for farmers to uh, assess biodiversity by themselves. That means when when they implement, implement some uh, specific uh, practice in the orchard, then they can try to assess how far this is um, having an impact impact in the in the orchard. Trying to see if they have more beneficials close to the flower strip or close to a hedge or a stone peel, for example. So those are simple measures for them to have a real. Um, uh, conclusion on on their practices because very often the farmers say yeah I I just hesitate to have a flower strip because the the results are not so easy for me so it takes me some time it costs money and I don't always have a, a, a concrete uh, feedback so this this tool was intended to help the farmers uh, using very simple tools and taking less than a uh, 30 minutes uh, to make a few countings and see that biodiversity is responding to to the practices they they, they change and so they, they can really think about uh, what is going on in the orchard and then reduce the, the spraying in the orchard because the more they will know beneficials and spiders and coccinelles and syrphids the more they will uh, uh, really be reluctant to use the the, the sprayer and uh, and insecticides. I would like to add uh, that we have produced um, a, a catalog with forty four measures for to enhance biodiversity, and in Germany there is a first um, association which is Bioland who created standards for biodiversity. So they integrated the um, adoption of biodiversity measures in the organic standards. And uh, the catalog that we produce is also the base of these uh, standards. And I think this is very important. And I hope that uh, more associations will follow these examples and that uh, biodiversity measures will also part, uh, be part of the organic standards. Thank you.